The Senate Committee on Elections and Ethics is called to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Chair Moss? Here. Senator Voino? Here. Senator Santana? Here. Senator McMorrow? Here. Senator Chang? Here. Senator Camilleri? Here. Senator Johnson? Here. Senator McBroom? Here. Mr. Chair, you have eight members present. There is a quorum. Thank you. Uh, welcome to our first uh, committee hearing on the Senate Committee of Elections and Ethics. As chair, I am ready to guide significant progress on the goals of why I ran to serve in the legislature in the first place, to ensure that every Michigander has the tools to better understand their state government and the rights to change their state government. We will provide our residents with transparent, honest lawmaking and an accessible pathway to reach the ballot box. On the elections front, many of our directives are outlined straight from the Michigan voters. Voting rights proposals in our state have passed with significant support. Proposal 3 in 2018 with 67% and Proposal 2 in 2022 with 60%. Those are Democrats, Republicans, and Independents who came together to strengthen our voting system so that everyone who wants to lawfully participate in our democracy has the ability to do so. On ethics, I could sound like a broken record citing the now year old, years old metrics from the Center for Public Integrity ranking Michigan as dead last of all state governments in terms of ethics, accountability, and transparency. Voters supported Proposal 1 to task us to join the 48 other states with a financial disclosure system for lawmakers. And as you know, 48 other states also have a process for residents to request the records from the legislature and governor. Michigan does not. I'm eager to continue these bipartisan transparency efforts with my partner, Senator McBroom, and all members of this committee. Uh, I respect the expertise from both of our vice chairs, former Warren City Clerk Paul Voino and former Secretary of State and my Oakland County Clerk, uh, Ruth Johnson. So with much work ahead, let's begin. Uh, as the first committee act in the new legislative session, we need to adopt the 2023-2024 committee rules. These have been emailed to the uh, respective offices prior to this meeting. So I'll entertain a motion to adopt the Elections and Ethics Committee rules for the 2023-2024 legislative session. Motion made by Senator Camilleri. Will the clerk please call the question? Chair Moss. Yes. Senator Voino. Yes. Senator Santana. Yes. Senator McMorrow? Yes. Senator Chang? Yes. Senator Camilleri? Yes. Senator Johnson? Yes. Senator McBroom? Yes. Mr. Chair, are there eight yeas, zero nays? The rules are adopted. Thank you very much. The rules are adopted, and we will go right into our agenda. And I see our wonderful presenters are already ready here. Um, we've had some ballot proposals that have given us clear directives. We've had some elections uh, that have given us some clear directives. Uh, and I thought it was very appropriate to start off our very first committee uh, with some of the deliberative analysis from our Department of State and our Department of Attorney General. So I will turn it over to Secretary of State Jocelyn. Benson and Attorney General Dana Nessel. Thank you for coming to our committee. Thank you for having us, Chairman Moss, and to all of you uh, for your service on this committee. We're excited to work with you in the next term. Uh, there's a lot of work we can do together that will help strengthen our democracy even more. And I want to start by emphasizing that we are one of our systems, one of the nation's strongest here in Michigan. We have a secure, fair, accessible process. There we go. Uh, that's also accurate and accessible as a, evidence from the fact that in the last two cycles we've seen the highest turnout elections in our state's history. Our elections are secure in part because they're decentralized, preventing systemic attack. Uh, paper ballots ensure uh, the accuracy and the, uh, the process after the fact can af affirm the accuracy of the count. And security checks throughout the system prevent fraud and have been enforced and reinforced for a number of years. In addition to that, our system is fair. It's overseen by over 1,600 clerks from around the state, Democrats, Republicans, Independents, a bipartisan board of canvassers certifies the results at the state and county level, and we have transparency throughout our system. It's also accurate. 
The facts show and continue to show our tabulator accuracy is strong and it's confirmed before and after elections. Post-election audits are also performed after our elections. Uh, we've had more robust post-election audits than ever before over the last several years, identifying best practices to ensure that we're continually improving our processes and our procedures at every level. And we have election officials on all sides of the state prioritizing accuracy over any speed when it comes to reporting results. But there's certainly more we can do, in particular in recognition of the fact that we are among the most accessible elections in the country. We've seen record-setting turnout in 2020 and 2022, uh, and that is due in no small part to a lot of the changes voters themselves have enacted in our state constitution, and that I've been honored to implement alongside our Attorney General. So noting that, in 2022, voters again enacted a series or one, one proposal that, that contains a series of amendments to our state constitution that we are now charged with implementing quickly and in time for the 2024 presidential election cycle. I want to talk just briefly about the top four aspects of that, of that proposal, of those amendments today, and what we need to do together to ensure we're ready to go in all the elections that occur in 2024 and even those this year. The four strongest provisions, most significant provisions of these amendments are, one, the creation of a permanent absentee voter list, two, the implementation and creation of early in-person voting in our state, three, the requirement for prepaid return postage at the state level for applications and ballots themselves, and also ballot drop boxes. So I'm going to go through each one and just uh, begin the process. There's a lot more, obviously, even to the proposals themselves, but I just want to touch upon these four and the beginning stages that we're in to ensure they're fully and robustly implemented. First, the permanent absentee voter list. Now, under the law, all voters have the right to complete just one application and then be mailed an absent voter ballot in all future elections. This status moves with the voter when they move throughout Michigan within jurisdictions and from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And notably, voters can be removed from the list upon request, upon cancellation of registration, upon the receipt of reliable information provided that, providing that the voter is no longer eligible, and if they don't vote for six years. And notably, this requires, once you're on the list, a ballot to be mailed in every election, state, federal, and local. The second primary provision of the new amendments is early in-person voting. Now, all voters have a right to early in-person voting at least nine days before the election, uh, for in the nine days prior to the election day. This is, as many of you know, polling place style voting where voters actually receive their ballots and put them through a tabulator. It's different than at the absentee voting that we've had in place where voters are dropping off a ballot and that ballot is then held until the processing begins on election day in most cases. Uh, in early voting, ballots are tabulated upon receipt. However, importantly, tabulator reports of results do not and are not run until after the polls close at 8 p.m. on election day. Uh, in addition, and importantly, municipalities within a county are able to share early voting sites that can be hosted either by a large municipality or a county. So there are cost-saving mechanisms built into the language, but certainly more we can explore together. Third, prepaid postage and ballot tracking. Now under the provision, all voters have a right to state-funded prepaid return postage on their ballot request forms and the ballots themselves. Voters have a right to state-funded system that tracks their ballot as well, uh, much of which we have implemented, but the robustness can always be improved, and uh, we want to ensure that we have the funds and resources to, to work with the Department of Technology, Management, and Budget in order to do that. But the ballot tracking system is importantly a part of that provision. And then finally, the fourth is the creation and security of absent voter ballot drop boxes. These are receptacles all throughout the state. Uh, each municipality must have at least one, and one for every 15,000 registered voters. They must be able to receive both the ballot request forms and the ballots themselves, and they must be uh, available 24-7 and distributed equitably across our state. They are also required to be available in every election, which requires that they be staffed and secured and monitored in every election. So... Next, I just want to talk briefly upon some of the initial legislation we see as needed to ensure the robust implementation of these new provisions. 
I should mention that our staff at the Bureau of Elections has done extraordinary work over the last several years with very limited resources to implement a wide array of new proposals that were enacted in 2018. What we learned and what we experienced firsthand through that process is that it's much easier to implement these changes, and I think our clerks would agree, with sufficient resources in order to do so. And by sufficient resources that are spent on both technology, machines, and people, it's helpful to know ahead of time what those resources are going to be so that localities and the state can plan appropriately. So we ask and encourage you to help us make some of those decisions well in advance of the 2024 election year because it will help our clerks prepare for what they need to identify and support. In addition to that, and in addition to the importance of providing resources to support and staff uh, our accessible early voting sites in every jurisdiction, uh, we also need to consider the fact that now we have two systems of essentially early ballots, one that will be received and tabulated right away, and others that would be deemed absentee and held and tabulated under the current law later. This creates a bifurcated du du duality to the process that is inefficient and will create confusion for many of our clerks, unnecessarily so. so so we, will enc we encourage you to consider legislation that would allow all ballots to be processed and tabulated at the same time upon receipt, uh, unless, of course, the voter requests otherwise. We also recognize that automatic voter registration is in our state constitution, and we still need to update our laws to ensure that all young citizens are able to be automatically registered by the age of 18. This would include the ubiquitous pre-registration of 16 and 17-year-old proposals that have come up numerous times throughout the last few years. I think now is the time to ensure they become law so that we can ensure the smooth implementation of automatic voter registration for every eligible voter in our state. Uh, and finally, and I know many of you know this, the importance of flexibility is key, whether it's expanding the types of places that are permitted to be used for polling places or precinct size. The bottom line of what we've seen in, work, in this work and in talking with clerks is that funding and flexibility is key, and with those two provisions, most other things can be achieved. On that note, funding. We'll be working with the appropriation committees, committees in both the House and the Senate to make sure they fully are aware of the funding needs of our election officials and our State Bureau of Elections to meet this mandate from the voters. Uh, I, as I mentioned before, what this really requires is predictable, sustainable, and efficiently available funding for every election. And we ask to be involved in those decisions, and our clerks as well, to determine specific costs and enable flexibility. We know the costs are significant, but we also want to work with you so that you all know and understand exactly where where those funds are being spent and why they're so critical to ensure that the mandates that voters have enacted in our state constitution fully and robustly and securely come to a reality. Among the things that we will need new funding for in this fiscal year are, of course, the nine days of early voting. This includes staff, equipment, and rental space, staffing for absentee ballot processing and tabulation, full and secure placement of drop boxes. We estimate a number of 2,000 will need to be implemented. Of course, the prepaid postage for ballot request forms and ballots themselves for millions of voters, as well as other costs to enable the technical upgrades, such as ballot tracking, that are now required under our state constitution. Prior to these new changes being enacted, some of you may recall I estimated that the cost of elections in some cases has increased exponentially over the last few years, in some jurisdictions over 60% as estimated by clerks. This means, and we estimate, that funding our elections is roughly $100 million annually just to simply do what we've been doing. That's about $20,000 per precinct per election, uh, or, or annually, I should say. With these new constitutional requirements, we estimate an additional 30 to 45 million is needed, both at the state and local level, and uh, that includes things for postage, Dropbox security, and as well as staffing of early voting. This is a brief breakdown uh, overview on these slides of these what we estimate are the needs for our local jurisdictions as well as the state. And I hope we can work together to ensure these needs are met. And we're, again, welcome and, and, and willing to do as, as granular level breakdown as you need in order to feel uh, certain that every dollar will be spent efficiently with an eye towards ensuring our elections are secure and accessible for all and that we continue our trend of increasing the security of and accessibility of our elections. But we can't do it without these resources. And though public-private partnerships are certainly possible, none of us prefer them. We prefer to be able to work with our partners at the state, local, and federal level to ensure our clerks have all the resources they need to meet the needs of our voters. 
Finally, I want to just mention that all of this is happening under a cloud of continual threats and harassment and misinformation. Voters are inundated with lies and false conspiracies about our elections. The intent of these lies and the effect is to undermine their faith in elections and cause them to distrust accurate outcomes, despite their accuracy. We can all work together to combat this misinformation, and part of my priorities for my second term is to go throughout the state and meet with voters and citizens, many in your districts, who have been misled, and talk with them in a transparent way, in fact-driven, data-driven way, about why they should have rightly placed faith in our elections. So I welcome your partnership in doing that. I think it's important uh, so that we continue to proceed in building faith in our democracy, not diminishing it. Not only because voters deserve to have rightly placed faith in our elections, but also because these lies lead directly to threats and harassment of election officials, poll workers, and even sometimes voters. They also lead to violence, as we saw firsthand in 2020, the tragedy in our US Capitol on January 6, 2021. The Attorney General is going to talk a little bit about what her office has also seen through her investigations into this topic. Uh, and before I turn it over to her, I'll mention that we've asked, and I know stood with many of you, to call for laws that will explicitly ban and penalize threats, harassment, and doxing of election officials and workers. We want to work with you to prohibit the deceptive practices that in involve intentionally sharing false information about our elections or a person's right to vote. And again, we want to provide funds to ensure the security of our elections, election workers, and voters. Our office was able to make $8 million available for that purpose in last year's election. Clerks took advantage of it, but it clearly was not enough. So I'm here today in hopes of partnership, in hopes of collaboration, and in hopes of progress. We've got a lot of good work we can do together, and I'm hopeful and confident we can. AG, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Madam Secretary, and thank you so much uh, to the chair and to the committee for allowing, um, my, for allowing me to be here today and uh, join Secretary Benson in her presentation. Um, you know, it is, it is fundamental that we ensure that our elections, of course, are safe and secure, but also, as the secretary indicated, the safety and security of our election workers. And there are so many things that I think this committee really needs to, to focus on. You know, enacting stronger protections for election workers, um, specifically prohibiting firearms uh, in locations where, where voters or election workers would be subjected to uh, threats, harassment, intimidation. Um, this committee, I hope, will be focusing on improving campaign uh, finance and lobbying regulations to ensure better public transparency. And then I think it's long past time that we take a good look at um, some significant changes to both uh, the Freedom of Information Act as well as the Open Meetings Act. So let me um, start with a, a little bit about what our department has done with, in concert with other departments um, in regard to elections. And I, I should tell you, these are things that didn't used to be necessary prior to the 2020 election. So before the election, uh, over the course of months, um, my office took a number of steps to protect voters and election workers. We had special agents from our office that met weekly uh, with the FBI, Michigan State Police, uh, local law enforcement agencies, and the Michigan Department of State. Then on election day, uh, the department uh, special agents had to set up a command post in Lansing and also in Detroit, where there were also FBI, um, DAG, special agents, MDOS, and analysts on hand to answer questions uh, through an election tip line that was set up by our office. And our agents responded to many, many calls and complaints relaying information back in real time. And then following the elections, our special agents uh, for this particular election, 2022, were asked to escort the board of canvassers, all of them, uh, along with Bureau of Election members to and from the certification vote. And agents from our department provided uh, protection on four occasions. Uh, each time putting together an operations plan with House and Senate Sergeant at Arms and Michigan State Police, um, which again is not something that used to have to happen. Um, the members of the board of State Board of Canvassers didn't used to need police escorts, but they do now. 
So I will say this, uh, the 2022 election in Michigan went incredibly smoothly, all things considered. I think it should serve as a model for other states, but you know that accomplishment um, only occurred because uh, of the work of my department and the secretary's department and our effort to disseminate information to poll workers through numerous MDAS sponsored online training sessions or through local clerks. Um, we worked with uh, the local law enforcement, MSP, and um, law enforcement, uh, the sheriffs all around the state and provided them with lengthy memorandums where we reviewed uh, each and every hypothetical that we could think of, basically war-gamed everything out for any side of circumstances that it could occur and um, all of the applicable uh, law. Uh, and I, I think we've been fortunate that we have escaped um, anything more significant than what we've seen, but we've had to prepare for that. Uh, and I just, I think it's absolutely critical that we put into place laws that better contemplate many of the circumstances that we've had to think about recently. So what we've seen at the Department of Attorney General through our investigations and our prosecutions is really this. Current election laws are simply not sufficient to meet the gravity of the moment and uh, the many newly imagined ways uh, that elections can be undermined that none of us ever thought of prior to 2020. And so, and I'll say to you what I said to um, uh, your colleagues in the House, an effort to circumvent the votes of 5.5 million Michigan voters uh, or massive petition signature fraud such that five gubernatorial candidates uh, are stopped from appearing on the ballot should not be treated the same as forging a $200 check that you pass at the grocery store. Those are different things. They have different outcomes, different implications for our democracy, and we need to have stiffer penalties in place that address those kinds of actions. Um, I also wanna talk for a minute about something that, um, that I think should be obvious to everyone, but it's been particularly obvious to me based on the fact that we have some really significant wide-ranging investigations that I think are well known to this committee. Dark money is the, the scourge of our government. It is corrosive in every way, shape, and form. And while there might be little that we can do about Citizens United, which I think many of us believe um, is uh, the Supreme Court decision that really has put the United States of America on the road to not really being much of a democracy anymore. There are things that we can do in Michigan, even if we can't stop the influence of special, influ uh, special interest money, we can shine a light on it. Um, and so while the courts have generally held that money is speech, and so limitations on money and political spending must be limited, those same courts have generally upheld laws that require campaign finance disclosure requirements, uh, which is something I'm strongly recommending. Uh, to require super PACs and 501c4s to disclose donors who make contributions over certain thresholds. Uh, you can create traceback mechanisms that can uh, identify the original source of campaign spending by requiring anyone acting as a conduit to track donations over certain dollar thresholds. Uh, to require public disclosure of who funds ads when the ad is broadcast or posted and that includes lists of top donors when ads are created by super PACs or other issue advocacy groups. You can limit or prohibited regulated industries and their associated political funds and executive employees from making political contributions to candidates uh, and elected officials. And this has happened in other states. We can strengthen laws prohibiting coordination between super PACs and C4s and candidate committees. Um, any disclosure and transparency laws have to include penalties for failure to comply, or what's the point? Um, the Michigan Campaign Finance Act allows candidates to solicit unlimited contributions on behalf of an independent expenditure committee supporting his or her candidacy, but at the federal level, candidates can solicit only up to $5,000 to a super PAC that supports them. We need to have some sort of cap in place here as well. 
as you are all well, well aware, and it's been talked about many times, we need changes to the Lobbying Act. Um, really basic stuff, cooling, a cooling off period, anti-nepotism laws. There are so many things that we can do. Um, the, the saying goes, I don't know, is it New York Times, Washington Post, I don't remember. Democracy dies in the darkness, right? Who said that? Judge Keith. Judge Keith, thank you, thank you. That's why I bring the secretary with me everywhere. She remembers who said what at all times. Um, this committee needs to seriously take a look at uh, OMA and FOIA. Now these are laws, as you know, from the 1970s, uh, so many years before I was born. Are we under oath? <laughs> no, we're not under oath. Not under oath, it's fine. Um, but, you know, creating, we have the mechanism to create transparency in government and to allow better participation from our citizens, right? So OMA, like we saw what we could do during the course of uh, the pandemic. Um, remote participation uh, for board members or for the public, uh, agendas that could be actually posted on a website. I know that when this was passed in the 1970s, they didn't have the internet. We do now. Um, we can insist that an agenda be posted on a board's website. We can say that a, uh, an agenda has to be placed on the website at least 48 hours in advance of a meeting. Um, we can say things like you can't amend a, an agenda in the middle of a meeting. Um, that would be great. Uh, we can say that public officials uh, can include someone who has been elected into office uh, even if their term has not officially begun, if they are already deliberating on important decisions involving things that the board is doing. Um, if you think I might be talking about a certain county, it's possible that I am. But the point is that there are a lot of ways that you can skirt FOIA, I'm, I'm sorry, OMA, because of the way that it's written right now. And it's just, it's high time that it was updated. I know I've heard many, many times, I've heard Senator Moss and I've heard Senator McBroom talk about FOIA and how this needs to be expanded uh, to the legislature and the governor's office. And what I have to say, I will say this on behalf of both of us, if we have to do it, you guys should have to do it too. I mean, we've, had, we've been doing this for four years. I think it's fine. What do you think? I mean, it's doable, right? You can be a government agency, you can be transparent, uh, you, can be sub you can subject yourself to FOIA and still do the work of the people and just allow the people to see the work that you're doing. So with that tirade, I will say, um, just generally speaking, a more transparent government uh, and a government that more easily and readily allows its citizens to participate is just simply good governance and I look, uh, I look forward to working with all of you, working with the secretary, um, to see that some of these reforms or these pieces of legislation can actually move forward with the ultimate goal, of course, and the singular goal of strengthening our democracy. And so I know you guys have a lot of work to do, and uh, I look forward to hopefully being a part of it. Thank you very much for that very uh, detailed presentation on some of the tasks uh, ahead of us. Uh, you, you touched on a lot of my passion projects. Um, you know, I think you could do a drinking game how many times FOIA is mentioned in this committee. Uh, it's obviously important to me uh, and to uh, Senator McBroom and the rest of us. Uh, and then you also touched on two other passion projects of mine, uh, reining in abuse of the petition process and reining in abuse of fundraising committees. And I tie those two together because, as you mentioned, those made headlines uh, in the last several years. Uh, I think that there are gaps in the law that have prevented uh, some investigative outcomes. Uh, and I know you're going through that process now. Uh, and so I think those are our tasks moving forward. If I had to ask, and we'll go to committee uh, uh, member questions as well, if I had to ask of all of the tasks on this committee, and I've committed that this is going to be a committee that produces, what are some of the most sequentially front-burning items uh, that have more timeline restrictions that we have to get done uh, on the front end of our work? Funding. Flexibility and protecting the people who protect democracy. That's, I mean, as we've said, as, as we said two weeks after your session began, we have elections this year. We have a contentious election cycle upon us in 2024. And there are things you can do right now to help us live up to the mandate that voters themselves 
expressed in 2022, uh, and that's ensuring that our elections continue to be secure, fair, accurate, and accessible, continuing and helping ensure that our clerks have all the resources they need to meet this moment, to feel secure in doing so, and to operate transparently and effectively in their jobs. Uh, and that's where the flexibility is so important. So uh, I, as you know, uh, because you're on it, we've established a working group uh, that will meet uh, at least monthly to review and, and propose uh, and observe changes and needs in the election administration community. And so I'm sure, and I appreciate your participation on that because I'm sure you'll hear more, but I think you'll see many of the themes fall under those uh, umbrellas. What she said. Great. All right, we'll go to committee questions, starting with our vice chair, Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to make a quick comment. Um, I wanted to thank you, Attorney General Nessel, for committing to try to get rid of dark money. I did that as Secretary of State, made an administrative rule, and got overruled. So I appreciate that. And I also had a bill that I'd like to share with you to expand FOIA when I was in the House and was not able to get it through. I look forward to working with you on both. There's nothing partisan about making sure citizenry has the information of where we get money when we run for office. And as you know, over half that money is not disclosed now in America. So thank you for that. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, I have Senator. Two Questions for Secretary of State Benson. Based on the U.S. Census and information from the Michigan Voter Information Center, our state currently has 104.5% of our 18-year-olds and overpopulation registered to vote on the qualified voter file. Can you please comment on some of the reasons that might be causing this and how the department's working to keep the voting rolls clean and to remove the individuals who have died or moved or simply are not qualified to vote? Yeah, I'd be Michigan. happy to. As you know, we inherited a list where there had not been a mailing to the list in over a decade, which created a lot of problems that we had to address proactively and transparently upon my taking office. Since then, uh, we have done a mailing to help ensure that we are looking at the list and removing registrations. Uh, currently, nearly 100,000 registrations are slated for cancellation because the voter no longer lives at the registration address. Uh, we are proactively and transparently making available the list of registrations to be canceled. We announced that last week. You probably saw that to ensure that no registration is canceled erroneously because we also want to ensure every eligible voter who's able to be registered is not erroneously removed. Now for the 100,000 res re registrations that are slated for cancellation because the voter no longer lives at the address, either these individuals surrendered a Michigan driver's license to another state or election officials received some sort of mail returned undeliverable as a result of our mailings or other information has been given to have our clerks have good reason to believe the voter has moved or changed their address. Prior to the 2020 election, they were also sent notice that their registration would be subject to cancellation if they did not respond or engage in any voter activity in the subsequent two federal election cycles, which was 2020 and 2022. So the two federal cycle waiting period that began upon my first term taking office is now uh, and required under state and federal law, that waiting period is now we're on the other side of it, hence the cancellation and the cancellations are now slated for mid-March. Uh, we have additional, uh, plans in place. Uh, we've actually set up a, a website where people can read about all that we do to ensure our qualified voter file is accurate. As you know, it's an ongoing process and it requires consistent uh, outreach and working with our clerks. Uh, and uh, But we were most, most um, beneficial to us was uh, the individuals who are slated for cancellation who are identified in the statewide mailing that we sent in 2020 and processed in 2021. Um, for sending out the um, the absentee ballot requests, but they didn't have on return if they if those people didn't live there, and so um, there were over half a million that came back, but hundreds of thousands that didn't. So uh, I would like to talk to you that further yeah. because that just simply didn't happen, and I know that there was a lawsuit for over 170,000 names that weren't removed before the next election. I have one more question. Um, we've seen legislation being proposed to remove the current requirements in Michigan in the law that addresses um, on an individual driver's license or state ID that it has to match the address on their voter registration. In other words, your driver's license and your voter registration have to match. Do you have a position on this legislation? And if you're supportive, could you please discuss, since both of these government documents are supposed to contain the individual's primary residential address, why or under what circumstances that you feel that these addresses 
could be different? Well, thank you for that. We have not yet seen that legislation, so I look forward to reviewing it with my team, and we'll work with you to make sure you know our position on it and, uh, and collaboratively as we move forward. All righty. And Thanks. when we're talking about banning deceptive practices, would that can, um, but also concern something such as ads on TV that millions of dollars went into that were really deceptive, and it said that the proposition on election would enshrine voter ID hmm. in our Constitution, but it didn't bother to say it will also enshrine no photo ID, knowing that 80% um, of the people, both Democrats, Republicans, and independents, all want photo ID. They simply deceived, put millions of dollars, and many people voted for it that didn't support it because they just didn't know. So what we're focusing on is the intentional misleading of voters about their rights. We recognize candidates and campaigns can oftentimes promote misleading information and would love to explore how to navigate through the First Amendment protections there. But in our focus, in our proposal, it's focused specifically on deceiving voters about their ability to receive a ballot and cast it and what happens once it's cast. So it's separate from the campaigns themselves. And that, we feel, is on firm constitutional ground. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will go to Senator McMorrow. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you both for being here. Uh, Attorney General, I'm really glad you brought up Open Meetings Act reform. One of the things that I think has been a silver lining of the past few years as it relates to the pandemic is we have the highest uh, worker participation among the uh, disabled Americans and uh, would love to work, and I'm sure we don't have the data here, especially given how decentralized our system is, but how many more people were able to participate in local city council meetings or boards uh, that if we are to, as OMA, uh, as that sunset has expired, uh, how many people are restricted from those meetings now? And that's something that I'd love to work with, with both of you on to make sure that we're increasing access and taking away the best of the past few years, not just going back to the way that things have always been. Yeah, I, I mean, I couldn't agree more. And I think we saw, we obviously saw heightened participation in you know all sorts of meetings at the local level, at the state level. Um, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I was with you, and I think also Senator Chang, at, um, uh, with a group of, um, of individuals from the disabled community who talked about the fact that this is the first time that they ever felt like they could participate in their government because it was so difficult for them to attend meetings. And at long last, they, they had that ability. And there are so many people that fit into that category. As you probably know, I issued an, uh, a formal AG opinion uh, last year that had to do with, you know, the ADA basically trumping or superseding um, OMA and allowing people who had uh, immune-related disorders, for instance, um, to participate remotely if, if they sat on a board so that, you know, we didn't have people who literally had to resign because they had health considerations and issues during the course of uh, a global pandemic. But I think that this is an issue that absolutely has to be explored. And the question is, how do we expand uh, government in a way that we have the, you know, the fullest amount of participation possible? And you know, will that just be the public? Will that be, um, will that be all uh, board members? Or if there's a, a quorum of people present physically, could it expand that way? I understand it's it's very nice to be in person, right? And you have to look people in the eye when you're talking to them. And I think there's definitely value in that. But I think there's also value in just ensuring that we have more people that can hear what we're doing, see what we're doing, uh, and feel like they're a, a part of their government. So all of that, I think, is very important. But going back to what I was saying earlier, Senator, there are just so many abuses, unfortunately, of OMA. And I know that you guys have the ability and the opportunity uh, to really tighten that up so that we aren't finding all these loopholes and ways to get around what that law intended. And I think we all agree that it was a well-intentioned law, but it's, it's, we're well overdue for some significant updates. So, I, and I know that members of the committee are interested in that, and I really look forward to working with you on it. Thank you. Senator Chang. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you both for your presentations. Uh, I had two questions for you, Secretary Benson. Um, one, I was wondering if we have any projections of the numbers of voters that we think will participate in the early voting sites based on, I don't know, any, any information we might have from other states or based on sort of the current process that we have. And then the second question was just around uh, the role of your department in ensuring um, training of election workers mm -hmm. who are going to have to do all of these things that we're talking about. Um, and I'm imagining there will have to be a lot more of them too. Um, so just making sure that, you know, that everyone is trained with the proper information and, mm -hmm. and uh, able to ensure that we are, um, you know, administering elections. Properly. Yeah, I think what we've seen is you build, building the system and then educating voters about the system are equally important and both require investment in time, resources, and support. And so for your first question on early voting, we, we will build a system that will anticipate what some of the data shows, which we could go as high as having two-thirds of voters in a given jurisdiction participate in voting early. That may not happen. It may be half. It may be 45%. What we've seen consistently over the last two elections, even in, notably in 2022, too, is that you'll get at least half in many jurisdictions, if not more, of citizens returning their ballots early. Well, many choose to, to now to return their ballots early and have them run through the tabulators upon return, it's probable. And so we'll build a system that expects and, and could meet the demand of a, um, you could say, 60-40 split with 60% voting, uh, voting early or absentee and 40% in person. And then one of the challenges of the moment that we're in, however, is that we also have to build a system that 60-40 the other way, essentially, that, that anticipates what if 60% show up on election day and 40% vote in, uh, ahead. As we get through a few cycles with these new provisions in place, we'll have more clarity. And certainly the 2020 election was potentially an aberration with the pandemic, having so many two-thirds of citizens vote absentee in that November election. So all the data is, is um, inconclusive, uh, as is voter behavior. And it depends. So we're required to basically prepare for both. And that's why for clerks, flexibility is key, because particularly particularly for clerks in smaller rural jurisdictions, like in the Upper Peninsula or Northern Michigan, or even in Northern Oakland County, there will be incidents where clerks will want to make their own assertions as to based on the, the communities they know and serve and what they expect. So we'll want to give clerks the flexibility on that as well. Um, all that said, that's one piece of it. The second piece of it is educating voters about uh, the early voting option, which though voters overwhelmingly voted to enshrine it in our constitution, what we found in 2020 it does, is that it doesn't mean that every everyone will remember that it is available or even know how to access it come 2024. So we'll also have to have a robust and grassroots education campaign so that voters know about that option. Uh, and I look forward to working with everyone here. I think we can all agree that is not a partisan or political campaign. It's simply just educating voters about their options at a time when there are a lot of other pieces of noise floating around. And so that's our work ahead of us, and that's why funding and flexibility are key, uh, and also protecting our election officials so that they can recruit poll workers, so that they can you know, show up in their community without fear of threats and harassment and help that education move forward. Our office will be also convening um, uh, thought leaders and other messengers to help spread that information, and we'll look forward to working with you on that and, and all of you here on that piece. Uh, lastly, on the training of clerks, similarly educating them and, and providing them with the resources that they need to meet the moment will also be critical. Expanding our BOE staff will, will help us do that, and we will be working with appropriations to articulate exactly what we see the needs of the BOE as well as the needs of many our, of our clerks to actually ensure that they are fully aware of the new provisions and able to meet the moment and implement them. Fortunately, we've implemented a lot of things uh, over the last few years, and so our clerks have become have adjusted and adapted to the changes, and that's a testament only to their own commitment to this work that is really inspiring and is frankly only grown I've seen across the board over the last few years. So I'm confident we'll be able to find ways to work together and, and make sure they're ready, but I can't, um, I can't underscore enough how important just that early investment is in helping us do all those things. And the last thing I'll mention is how I ended my presentation as well, is remember all this is happening in the midst of politically charged misinformation campaigns. And so our effort to both build the system, protect election officials, and educate the public about their options to vote all needs to be protected from that. And the best way we protect it from that is early investment in education uh, and, and communications and support so that we empower everyone to know the truth even when the misinformation comes. So 
that's probably a lot, <laughs> but but that's um, uh, the, the the last thing I'll just say uh, on that is that we have the benefit of having four more or less gone through this once before in the advance of 2020 and preparing to implement those changes from the 2018 constitutional amendments. So for all of us across the state, that muscle is fresh, but it still will need help and support and and um, and and recognition of how challenging it has indeed been to do, in some cases, three times the amount of work that some folks have done in the past, just in order to make sure our promises are kept to voters throughout the state. Uh, Senator McBroom. We'll pass. We'll go to Senator Voino. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you both for being here today, too, and the fine work uh, you've done over the past four, uh, four years. Um, uh, Madam Secretary, I'd like to ask you if you might expand a little bit on flexibility for polling places and or precinct sizes. Where I'm coming from, I'm thinking, or what I'd like to see, is um, perhaps super precincts of some uh, point. Uh, going back 25 plus years, if not more, the clerks would run the elections for the schools, and they took that over, and the superintendent's principals were very accommodating at that time in providing uh, locations. But now through the years, there's been so much consolidation within school districts and also with new superintendents uh, expressing concerns that they don't want their locations uh, being utilized. I know it wouldn't fit in all cities, but in the city of Warren, we have two large community centers, and the ability to create super precincts in those uh, locations would be fantastic. And I also would uh, look forward to working with your work group uh, in streamlining the provisional ballot process in some way. I've heard that from the clerks, make it, make it easier, and it also ties up voting at times when a voter needs to be issued a provisional ballot, and I know you know that. But if we could address that uh, at some point, too, to make it uh, a lot easier to uh, fill out and process a provisional ballot, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. I agree on the provisional ballot piece, and, and uh, that's something that's now 20 years old. It was enacted after the 2000 election cycle, uh, but there's, uh, so we've got a lot of data to show the ways in which it's ineffective and inefficient, uh, but can also be used in ensuring that voters have, who, who, who need it, have that option and, and that it's readily available. So we'd love to, to confer with your office on that further and, and examine what can be done to address that piece. Um, regarding the polling place location, I think flexibility is, is key. It basically, I, I believe that if a clerk of a jurisdiction has a location, whether it be a community center or in some cases, as it was in Detroit, Ford Field, and wants to host or utilize that space, they should have the flexibility to do so. Of course, we want to have provisions in place to protect the security of the location, to ensure the accessibility of it, which is oftentimes a concern with larger facilities that don't have parking. So there are ways to structure, I think, and expand what uh, places are permitted to be used as polling places, even building on the, the legislation that was passed last year to ensure more flexibility for clerks, as I think is what is, is, is going to be most needed, particularly over the next three to four election cycles, where all of these changes are going to be settling in to voters, and we'll start to see patterns emerge. But as the pattern, until those patterns emerge, we need to give clerks as much flexibility as they can to choose what's best for them and their community. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Senator McBroom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My apologies. I couldn't remember my question when it came to me. That's earlier. all right. Um, thank you for your presentations and, and a lot of issues to work through, and, and I think we can work on together and hopefully come to uh, you know conclusions that we can agree on. Um, one thing that you didn't address, uh, Madam Secretary, that I'd be curious to um, hear your perspective on is changing the law to require uh, the imaging of ballots to be saved and um, available for um, voters to look over themselves afterwards. Many states are already doing this. Um, it's something in Michigan we didn't require, and at times we've even told clerks to turn it off to save bandwidth when they're transferring results. So I'm wondering what your perspective is on adding that to the mix of reforms that you're recommending. Be willing to talk with your office more about that and certainly involve the clerks in that discussion as well as our BOE staff because as with anything, we have to examine the security impact uh, and the potential for unintended consequences and would be welcome to also bring in folks from other states who have done a lot of work on that too. So as you know, in all things, I like to just drown decisions in data and, and perspectives and, and, and so I think in things like that, certainly um, there are some valid reasons to consider it 
uh, for both security and transparency uh, and, uh, and helping voters restore and ensure they have rightly placed faith in the results of the election. And so let's examine that alongside any other concerns or, or perspectives that may come to fruition by talking to clerks in other states and see what's possible. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I ask the Attorney General a question as well, please? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Madam Attorney General, when it comes to the Open Meetings Act, one of the issues that I think makes it a little difficult is that it's actually a criminal penalty for violating the Open Meetings Act. And I'm not aware of any times where that's actually been charged on anybody, not in recent memory anyway. And I'm wondering if there isn't a better function. Right now, you know, my experience, and I suspect for many of my colleagues, is phone calls from angry residents who say the Open Meetings Act has been violated. And what am I supposed to do with those calls? You know, I can direct them to your office or I can tell them to get their own lawyer. But a lot of times when all is said and done, if they're correct, the, the people in the meeting just get back together, reconvene and d fix whatever minor problem they actually violated and, and move on. Um, how do we differentiate between that? And, and what could we be doing in the law to reform that so that um, there's maybe not sending people to jail for for things that aren't intentional, but also you know helping our citizens have a clearinghouse of information on this rather than calling our offices and asking us to get involved in what's usually a messy local dispute. Yeah, it's it's a real conundrum. There's no question about it. On one hand, of course, we, we want people to serve on, on local boards, on county boards, and certainly on state boards and commissions, um, but we want them to do it properly. Uh, and you know, when when I got in office, I had sort of opened myself up to say I am willing to explore, in egregious cases, um, prosecutions under OMA if if I um, am alerted to those circumstances. And what it seems like it's not just a misunderstanding of the law, but bad faith that's involved. And what I have found over the course of the last several years is that many times, I mean the. OMA is just not very strong. When you look at the law, it's very, very vague. Mm -hmm. It's not, as a prosecutor, it's not a great law that you want to go into court uh, and criminally charge somebody with. I will say, what I've often wondered um, is that why, uh, you know, in law school, and this would be a good question for a former law school dean I'm sitting next to, why there isn't uh, more focus on instructing on OMA and FOIA, because you, you get attorney's fees. Uh, so it's it's a, like a contingency case. If you win, um, the uh, the party, the losing party, has to pay uh, your fees, um, and it's I think considered reasonable attorney fees, um, depending on where you are and what you charge. Uh, but um, it, I think that firstly. I'm not saying that prosecutors, and I'm not saying my office shouldn't be taking a closer look at uh, criminally charging in certain instances, but I think what would be most helpful is just to, uh, to A, make the, the act um, easier to enforce by making it, again, less vague and less susceptible to challenges, uh, which I could see coming, certainly, in a criminal prosecution. Um, and also, I mean, I, I think the fines will probably have to be increased so that the municipality or the locality or whoever the government entity is, you know, has to not only pay those attorney's fees, but have substantial fines that it's facing. And I think that's the way I hope to get the citizens, to get the, the local residents, whoever the constituents are, to be pretty upset if the fact that their local unit of government is costing them, the taxpayers, a lot of money, I don't think they're going to want them to serve in those offices anymore. So increasing the fees might be something to look at. But I, I sort of agree. I, I don't know that criminal prosecutions are, are the way that we really want to view this. But there have to be other kind of penalties yeah. uh, in place for certain. Because as, as you say, it happens all the time. It happens too often. And I think for a lot of citizens, it's like, what's our recourse? And they don't feel like they have any. And it's, it's frustrating. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. Thank you, Senator McBroom. <laughs> and you highlight, and it's worth echoing, OMA and FOIA 
have existed for a long time largely unchanged and need to be fluid and a living document that is current with the terms and conditions that we live in. Um, we've gone through many endeavors together to look at FOIA reform, seeing FOIA again, uh, but you know, OMA as well is something that should not be overlooked, that it exists, it's been in a period of time. Is there a chance to refresh it, look at it, and see if it uh, is connecting to uh, how people utilize it, uh, both both the people who are in the office holding the meetings and the people who are observing the meetings themselves. So I think those two items are definitely worthy uh, uh, of a refresh. Uh, and then we will go uh, to another question from Senator Johnson, R Vice Chair Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Secretary of State, how do you envision the implementation of Proposal 2 of 2022 will be handled? Do you anticipate going through the administrative rules process or coming to the legislature for enabling laws to implement more detailed processes to carry out the provisions of this amendment? Like, for example, the exact processes and procedures for how early in-person voting will work. Um, I want to work with you all. That's why I'm here today. Hence the presentation. And, and I'll make an additional note. We have, since the, the announcement of these committees, uh, have been very communicative with the Secretary of State. And I, I know that there's going to be a good faith effort for this committee to work hand in hand with this department um, to make sure that we have a good, transparent legislative process that implements uh, what the voters have designated, designated us to implement. I appreciate that. So with currently there was... We do have one more question after this, so if you can I keep it wait. brief. Yep. Um, because we do have 104.5% currently, to, as of two days ago, of people registered to vote in Michigan. I was wondering, um, with the constitutional amendment that requires the over 1,500 local clerks to send not uh, requests, but actual ballots, we're talking about four and a half percent of the population getting an actual ballot that has no right to vote. And I was wondering if you have a process in place to make sure that simply doesn't happen. Yeah, first, uh, you know, I, I, I encourage you to look stronger at the data of the 104 percent um, comparison because that's been debunked. But that said, uh, the law oh, excuse itself. Me. We're going to let the no, secretary. We're going to let the secretary answer the question that was asked. Th that's not comparison. been debunked. That is census data yeah. and the QVF. Yeah, and that was just two days ago. All right, which is a we're going to let the secretary answer the question the that was asked. The voter registration and eligible to vote, and that I can, well, well, our office will send you some of the research that does that, so you can see it for yourself. Uh, the law itself requires us to send absentee ballot applications, uh, or I'm sorry, the, the law, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. The law only allows ballots to be received by people who've requested them. And so people can request to be on the permanent AV list, and from there in every election, they will get a ballot. That's under the law. And so what we'll be doing, as I laid out in my presentation, is a number of things to continue to ensure that list is up to date and that people can remove themselves from it if they'd like. Thank you. All right, Senator Camilleri has been patiently waiting, so we'll go down to the other end of the table. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you both for your presentation. I mostly just wanted to, uh, we're getting to time, so I really just want to say thank you for all of your exemplary work over the last four years, and I think that today's presentation showed that there is a lot of work to do. Uh, we have a brand new uh, set of faces in this legislature that I think are eager on both sides of the aisle to get to implementing the constitutional changes that we've seen, protecting people, making sure that these threats to our democracy are no longer uh, a key piece of the, the pressures that we face as elected officials, and then we just get to work getting a lot of things done. Uh, so I really just want to say thank you uh, and appreciate all the hard work that you've brought so far in these four years, and I just know that we'll be able to chart a course together. And that's, I think, the key part of this committee that I, I just echo the chairman's call here, that we've got a lot of work to do, and we look forward to, and, and willing and eager, we're e willing and eager to get, to, get, to get started. So thank you. Thank you, and seeing that this committee is ready to work, uh, we appreciate your time. Uh, in presenting to us. I think we have our marching orders from the voters, requests uh, and guidance from the respective departments, and we're ready to partner with you uh, as the term goes ahead. So thank you very much for your time. Of course, I see no other business and no other questions uh, on the agenda, so the Senate Committee on Ethics and Elections is now adjourned.